podcast like this. Who gon' bring it to the table? Boss talk. Who your girlfriend favorite? Boss talk. We gon' do it how you want it. Boss talk. Yeah, everybody on it. Boss talk. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Mr. Mako. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. I'm a day all gone. I want y'all to stop what you're doing right now. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. When I mean all, I mean all. I mean our Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you name it. We're on it. Just Google us, Boss Talk Podcast 101. We'll pop up first in line, I guarantee you. But if you want to see all our visuals, you got to go over to our YouTube channel. There you see all our visuals. Just type in Boss Talk Podcast 101. We'll pop up. But if you want to see our exclusive content, you got to go ahead and join our membership. How you do so is under each and every video, including this one right here in the description section below. There is a link that says join our membership. That's how you can see stuff way ahead of everybody else. And you never know, you might find some surprises over there. But thank me later and thank you for all the love and support. Man, hey, man, listen, man, we got a special guest in there today. She really don't need no introduction. Um, you might have seen her at the White House. We don't know. You might have seen her. Uh, uh, she got streets named after. It's a lot of stuff that goes with this young lady here today. Her story is going to blow you away, man. Miss Belinda stands in the building. What's going on, girl? What's going on? Man, we so happy to have you. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here today. Man, hey, man, listen, man. You know how we do, Miss Jamaica, man. We got to figure this out, <laughs> man. We got to break this all the way down. We got to figure out what's going on with Miss Belinda. That's a beautiful name, by the way. Thank yes. you. Let's get to it. Who named you? Mama, Daddy? How, where did she come with her name? My great-grandmother named me mm. after her mother and her father, Virgil and Melinda. Okay. Have you ever met somebody else with that name? I have not met anyone with that name, but I've heard a couple of people say they knew someone with the name. Okay, that's that's different. That's mm -hmm. different. I like it. So you're born and raised in East Texas? Well, born in Los Angeles, moved to East Texas when I was five with my great-grandmother and my grandmother and the rest of our family. We moved from Los Angeles uh, to East Texas. Uh, so you don't remember anything about Los Angeles at five years old? You... I, I do I do remember a lot really? about Los Angeles. At, at five? I remember younger What do than you that. remember? <laughs> what do you remember? Well, I remember at four, I got hit by a car. Huh? I, I, I remember being hard-headed. Uh, Say, we, don't run out in the street. No, there was an ice cream truck out there, and I wanted... It, you know how your um, police uh, RV mm -hmm. vans that they have, where our ice cream trucks were about that size. Okay. And there were cars parked, and there was a dime on the... Um, on the dresser that they told me not to bother. The family was sitting on the porch and I went and stole the dime. <laughs> and the last I remember was standing between two parked cars because I did see a car coming. But from what they told me, I just ran out into the street. I got knocked three houses down. Dang, and, and you didn't even die. Fortunate, well, fortunately, the lady that hit me was a nurse. Oh. And she, uh, she uh, did CPR on me at that time. And then I remember awakening in the ambulance as they were taking me out into the hospital. Any broken bones? Any, no anything? broken bones. I just have a scar on my wrist. God's wow. grace, I'm still here. Let me tell you something, that's man. Crazy. That's what the devil come to do. He come to kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. He was trying to take you out. He but was. God had a plan. Yes. And you've been fulfilling it ever since. Absolutely. Man, I, I that's where it go that. down. Let's get We're to it. We're the only it. child? No, I'm the i I'm the first of five. You're the first of five. So yes. at five so at when you were four years old, how old was the second one? I was four when my mom had Okay, my, so my you sister. were the only one at that time. Whenever, <laughs> right? Okay, I, I was just checking I was, to see if there was yes. any other kids running no, around. No, no other time. kids around. You know, um, I do remember when she had my sister, and I remember picking her. We picked her up from the hospital, and I said, "Is her name Linda too?" Because they called me Linda for short, mm -hmm. and she said, "No, her name is Monique." And I'm okay. like, "Okay," but I remember those a lot of things vividly. Mm -hmm. um, People always remember because I can see why you remember at four because that's a traumatic situation because mm -hmm. like I don't remember a lot of things when I was younger but I remember certain traumatic you know because you're never, never going to forget stuff like that right but um okay so you your mom was there your dad was living in the same household no, as well I, no I was raised by three beautiful women my mother my grandmother and my great-grandmother so where was your dad do you know your father at that time no I did not you knew who he was. I knew who he was, but he was not residing in Los Angeles at the time. Okay, where where was he from? Seattle. Seattle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when did you? How did you meet him? And 
who connected those dots and how old were you? I was 25 when I met him mm. and who connected the dots were just the works of God um, working within me, my intuitions. Um, I always wanted to be a detective, a lawyer, you know, they used right. to come. <laughs> they used to call me Perry Mason because I asked a lot of questions. OK, um, but throughout my uh, childhood growing up, I was in beauty pageants and different things of that sort. And a lot of the girls always had both parents, mother and father. And that's when I started, I was in middle school and I started to kind of yearn for that father figure and wanting to know who and where my father was, what, you know, what type of man was he. And from that point on, I just started researching and looking. And I had a summer job when I was in high school at the um, Federal Bureau investigation wow. there in Tyler and just talked with a couple of people in there how I could do this and just started getting some lead answers way. right but I still could not connect the dots and it wasn't until 1988 um, after I went into the mortuary field um, you know you meet a lot of pastors and this mm -hmm. that and the other and I met a pastor that was from Los Angeles and I asked him did he know this particular person and they said, yes, she plays over here at this church. And when I was in Los Angeles, I went and I saw her. Mm -hmm. And I told her who I was. And she remembered me when she saw me from all those years. Mm. And then I asked her, did she know where my father was? Mm -hmm. And because she was married to his brother. Okay, okay. And okay. so um, she said, yes. And I said, well, I need to contact him. And she said, well, let me give them a call and see if it's okay to pass the number on. And it just went on from there. And he said, yes. Yes. Oh, wow. What was that conversation like for the first time? For the first time? And how emotional were you? Because, you know, we fem females can be very emotional. I, I don't believe I was emotional. I was just more excited that she had given me the number. And when I called, uh, I wasn't really excited. I just wanted answers. And I got the answers. Oh, so he did give you those answers. Yeah, yes. He, you know, that's a blessing, right? Yes. Because I've seen people who sit in that same seat. And I'm always like, why don't you ask these questions? Because people can carry on those hurt and those unanswered um, questions in their life and cause trauma down the line. Absolutely. And they have tell me, well, they tried to ask and her dad said, just tough it up, grow up type of you yeah. know thing and not really give them what they need. So the yes. fact that you got the answers that you needed, yes. how did that make you feel? Did you? Well, I, I felt did you understand? I felt a little. His answers matched up with what my mom had told me. Oh, okay. So everything was cohesive. Okay. And um, then I asked, how many brothers and sisters did I have? You know, and he told me, and I'm like, okay. You know, but still, um, at 25, you know, I was still wet behind the ears. I was still green because I didn't hang the streets. I hadn't done drugs or anything. So I was kind of naive to the worldly things. So a lot of things I didn't catch on to later in life. Did you ever get around to doing drugs? No. Okay, so that that wasn't gonna happen anyway. I'm no. I never did. Yeah, I'm I'm watching everything over no. here. Yeah, I'm watching everything. You never got high on that crack. It was crack air and everything. No and weed, no none of that. No. Yeah, see, so you already had another uh, uh, thing going. Um, so you know to be able to go through everything that you went through as a child, being hit by a vehicle, um, also, you know, just growing up and God still been holding your hand. Let's talk about just how, you know, as a, a, a 20, 21 year old, like 22 year old, what was the things that amused you during that time? Um, entertainment. Um, growing up, I've, I've always wanted to be this famous entertainer. And I looked highly up to Diana Ross because I loved her showmanship. I loved her attire, her glamour. Yeah. And so that kind of drew me in. Um, during that time, it was also Natalie Cole and Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want to be and, like and those Patty women. Patty LaBelle. Patty don't, LaBelle. Yeah, don't, don't never do that. <laughs> no, not, you didn't let me finish. Don't never do that. So my, my favorites I listened to was Patty LaBelle, Aretha Franklin, Natalie Cole, and Diana Ross. Yeah. And Diana yeah, Ross go. didn't have the vocals for me. But she had the showmanship. She mm. had the presentation. She had the full package. Out of mm -hmm. all of the ones that you named, who had the best vocals? Oh, well, Patty and Aretha's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's say each of them had their own because Patty yeah. was, uh, say, the world of singing. And at that time, Aretha was gospel. So... I always combine the two, but those two, I mean, I, I have the powerhouse of Aretha and the showmanship of 
Patty. Yeah, so you too studied bad. them. Too bad you didn't get yes. the, the growl of Gladys Knight because she was in that thing. Too. Yeah, she was in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it now. Don't you? I'm, I love my music. I can do yeah. her. Yeah. Oh, you can do her? <laughs> I listened to her, but they, she wasn't. Give me a little bit of she her. Wasn't let me what, hear. She wasn't what am I? I want to yeah. hear. I want to hear that growl he's that talking about. What growl? It was just a thing where she found she she had a a, a different she had a twang than the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Every one of them had a different thing. Uh, Patty is she can go high and it's so so high. It was before Mariah Carey started mm -hmm. doing that. Y'all mm -hmm. was really amazed yeah, by right. Mariah, but Patty had that. Patty can go as high as. That's yes, what I'm saying. She Mariah's. was already, but still, when they heard Mariah, they kind of. Right. Oh, you, well, I, then, I wasn't impressed like that. Mariah was. only hit one note. There you go. <laughs> so, so, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, but you got to realize Gladys came in, and during that time with co competition, the way it was, you know, she had to be unique in order for her to be able to be able to stand out during that time. Yes, yeah, she was. You was. see what I'm saying. Yes, her voice so. her voice was different. Her tone was different. She was more of the lower range, um, and she was very mellow. And then she had the men around her. There you go. So that neither that, one of that, us. You that's liked what that made song? her also unique and yeah. original. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because each of them had their own originality. The pips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dang pips. pips. <laughs> so you were singing in church as well growing up? Yes. Um, I didn't know I had the vocals at yeah, that time. Yeah, I was about to but say. But I was kind of like... A little tomboy. I like to climb trees. I used to run and turn flips. I wanted to be a gymnast. And then one evening, my great grandmother took me to their choir rehearsal, and the uh, pianist asked me, "Could I sing?" I said, "I don't know if I can sing or not." And she started playing a song, and she said, "Just repeat after me." And when I started singing, it was like this voice came and it surprised me, you know. And from that point on, and I was nine, and they put me in the young adult choir, and I was leading. All the songs mm, mostly. Wow. Where you but, get your vocals from? So you, it was your great grandmother. Well, I just know it. Just anointed by God. Okay. Anointed by God. There are a lot of musicians in my family. My mother was a classical pian. Well, not well. Yeah, she was. She doesn't play anymore. But she was a classical pianist, and she played the flute, and I played the flute, and I had an uncle who played flute, and my father found out he was in a band. He played bass. Mm -hmm. um, so the music came from all around, from, from each side of the family. But the vocals, there was no one in the family that really sang, you know, like God has anointed me to. Wow. I, you know, I really love that song you sung the other night. And she tried to put you on the spot a while ago. I, <laughs> I do it a little bit different because I like to keep people in their zone of what they love to do. This is a mm -hmm. big show where people are watching. Um, and you know the song you sung the other night was I won't complain you know yes. and that's one of them you know his eyes on the sparrow there's a bunch mm -hmm. of songs you know what I mean but he stood up what he was the, like, yeah I had to <laughs> he I, couldn't yeah but sit what's out. the but first of all that's my business when the Lord working <laughs> with me in between me God and the and the sumptress the one who's singing you know it had nothing to do I didn't, nobody else wasn't in the room once that happened you know I took off I took flight is what they say spiritually. So I enjoyed that the other night. But what other song would you sing if you if you had to pick a song to sing and you knew people were gonna may get touched by it, right? Mm -hmm. Precious Lord. Let me hear it. Precious Lord, take take my hand. And lead, lead me on, let me stand, oh, I, I'm tired, and I, I am weak, Lord, you know. Take 
take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. All right, all right, all right. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, people don't understand the song. The song is what it gives you power and strength. Like, it helps your beautiful voice as well, you know, but the song helps people when they're going through it. It's yes. the only thing you got a lot of times when it, when it when when you're having issues in your life and you can hear a song, it might change your whole mood, you know what I mean? Yes. So, and, and, and this show, to be honest with you, with people that watch it, Somebody could be in a situation or going through something, and yes. they may hear you singing, and they may be. It may be any time of the night because they watch this show all through the night. All you from from time and time again, they watch this spot. They may see a clip, but at the end of the day, it could keep somebody from either committing suicide. It could keep people from, you know, they could be right there at the edge of doing something crazy yes. and hear your voice and change their mind. You know what I mean? And change yes, their heart. Yes. So I thank you for that. That's why I do that on here with the people that have a gift. Because that's a gift. Yes. The Word of God talks about a gift. When you look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about a, a gift. You know what I mean? It, 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 in, in, I ain't going to go there, but I can take you there. But in chapter 5 of Galatians, <laughs> it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the gifts, the of, the gifts Spirit. of the Spirit. So that gift, you you have that gift to sing, man, and keep using it to help the people so I, that they'll I be will, able to. as long as man, I can breathe. Listen, man, I, I got my, I, I'm going to get that CD in a minute. You ain't getting it back. <laughs> But you know I, got, I but I want to know because I know what I get when I hear you sing. But wh how do you feel when you do that? I feel such freedom. I feel when I'm singing all of my pain that I'm enduring, all the hurt that I have endured, all of that goes away. You know, when, when I found out and figured out the voice that, that God gave me and then the power that my voice has, it helps me with my healing, mm -hmm. my inner healing. Um, I look at all the different tragedies that I've gone through, um, and it just it keeps me. It's what's kept me. Mm -hmm. My singing and just the just the freedom, the feel of Gives being you comfort. free. It's like I'm free, no matter what someone has done to me. I'm free. Mm -hmm. Wow. Have I you ever had training? No. No vocal training. No, ma'am. At all. No. No, that's I, crazy because, mm. you know, um, you you and I, I have to get into it. You know, you you had hit, end up you you wanted the people that stand for uh, HIV and help people that done went through it. We got to get into that basket. You know what I mean? Like, because yes. there was a time when this thing was something that people. W I mean, I was one of them. We feared to even conversate about it, to be yes. honest with you, during the time that you was dealing with it. You know what I mean? Where there was not a lot of medical treatment that we was sure about. Yes. And you was able, God brought you through. So we want to talk about that a little bit. You yes. know what I mean? Okay. How old were you when um, you were diagnosed? Okay, how old was I? In well, it was in my early 30s. Actually, early I, was, 30s. It was 30, I was 30. Okay, and this was right after you've had 30. your daughter. The, my daughter was nine years old at okay. the time of my diagnosis. Okay, and um, before this, you knew anything about AIDS or HIV or anything? You had any um, knowledge about it? The only knowledge that I had about it was, I remember the year before I got tested, um, how it, it came out to the world about AIDS and how everyone should go and get tested. So the year prior, I went and got tested, and my test was negative. What year was that? That was in 93. Okay. okay. So um, I was negative. And then I had started dating a guy um, not long after that, and we didn't have sex or anything. We dated for a year where we were just dating because I had come to a point in my life to where I said, if, if or when I get with a man again, we're going to be married. Okay. You know, I said, I'm going to be the Mother Mary now. I'm the right. Virgin Mary. <laughs> because you had went through right. trauma before. I, I had before. went through a lot of things before. Mm -hmm. And so when I did start dating this guy, and I was like, you know, if you're just with me because you think we're going to be sexually active, that's not happening. You know, but we had a wonderful year of dating. And then he had proposed to me. And then I said, well, before we get married, we both need to go get tested for HIV to make sure that we're both you know, straight. I ain't already knew I was straight because I did the year before. So right. I went a whole year, no sex or anything. And um, 
my doctor had called me back after the testing and asked me to come into the office and I thought it was strange. So I had all kind of weird thoughts, but it never was that, you know, it was like, well, why is he calling me back in? And so when I got back in, not only, they didn't take me to a room, they took me to his office and he sat and he shared that with me. Um, my fiance was negative um, but he had shared that with me that I was positive and he didn't believe it because we knew what we did the year before. And that's the same doctor. Yes. That, okay. And so um, he, I said, well, I want to be retested. He said, yes, we're going to retest. So we, he re, after they drew my blood, I laid hands on the vials of blood and I prayed over them. And I just started seeing his eyes on the sparrow as they were taking the blood out, you know, just to keep from crying. You know, I was being strong. And um, that's when I found out. Wow. Mm. And during this time, you know, you got to understand these are very early times. This is when it's really first starting. People are getting it through different things from blood from transfusion. People were real drugs. drugs mm -hmm. uh, but but medical me medically, people hadn't really understood this yet. They d they did not understand it at that time. So um, it was my gynecologist I had went to. Uh, because that was my main doctor I went to when I was there. And so he did, the, you know, did the testing for me. And then so after that, then he said, well, you need to go see your, your PCP. Mm -hmm. And um, the PCP then instructed me over to the uh, infectious disease doctor. Mm -hmm. And really, even the infectious disease doctors back then, they really didn't know how that to handle. Much, right. But it kind of the HIV fell under their umbrella. So a lot of them were forced into it. This my opinion. A lot of the doctors were for the the uh, infectious disease doctors were forced into that, and then some took a passion for it to get to learn and know more about it. But I wasn't put on meds right away. Um, they really didn't know what to do. Did, did you figure out um, how did you get it? Like who did you ever trace it back? Because um, you know, I, like nowadays it'd be like, okay, well you have to go ahead and inform everybody that you've had intercourse mm -hmm. with or whatever, so so that they can get tested as well. Right. Right, and, and the few people that I did talk with was negative. And I had been, prior to that, I had been molested and I had been raped. Okay. Um, so. How long before that? That was, oh, it was maybe seven, eight years before, before. that. Mm. And so when I talked with them about it, you know, because I knew when I moved where I was, living where I was, I knew I hadn't been involved with anyone. Right. So having this conversation with the doctors like it, it it laid dormant is what it did right and it didn't show up right away um about 10 years Ooh. that it it showed up you know mm. and it may have showed up earlier but by doctors really not knowing, knowing what it then was. and with the same you know kind of there's really no symptoms of hiv mm -hmm. i know prior to that i was going to the doctor a lot because i was getting ear infections and like i caught the flu one time and I wasn't a sickly person. So I was going, my mom said, you're going to the doctor quite often. I said, yeah, I got a cold. And I was living in Seattle at the time. So I thought it was because of the elevation and mm -hmm. everything. And I lived in the valley. So the house was up on a hill and you, you know, right. So that's just what I thought. But prior to that, those, those were my only symptoms I can say about that. And, um, yeah, the rest is, what it is when when you when you look at that time period back then were you before easy e was contracted? I, I was right after magic was diagnosed so did you even remember and, when Eazy -E? and i remember when easy -E had it uh that was before y'all yeah he was before me yes so that had yes. to be a, his that. his was his was before and when you trace it all the way back it really 1988 i want to say is it was in the 80s when it came out, but it wasn't, they didn't really make it public no, they did. conversation no, they, no, back they did. then. They, it was back in the early 80s, and uh, Magic came out, I think it was 92, somewhere around in there, and I was diagnosed right after he was. Um, but at that time, the conversations were very negative. The conversations were very negative. I was very private. I only had told my mother and my father um, of my diagnosis at that time, and then I waited a couple of days, and then I had to share it with my nine-year-old daughter. Wow. Man, it had to be tough. How was that having a conversation with her about it? Well, 
I've always been real with her and had real grown up conversations with her because she was my only. Um, but at that time, after being diagnosed, I just started seeing death. I would see myself in a casket flashing before my eyes. It was just death all the time. So I said, you know, I don't receive this diagnosis, but it's the diagnosis that I was given. And at that time, everybody who was being diagnosed was dying, right, you know, shortly after. And so I started my preparation of, I need to share this with her. I need to tell her. And Just I'm, in case. And I'm thousands of miles away from home where my family family is. And I had one girlfriend there, and I shared with her. And I said, here's where my things are. If something happens to me, I need you to fly my daughter home to my mom. You know, if something happens. Did so, anybody, like, treat you differently once they found out? The, like, no one back knew. I'm no. talking to people that you the, actually the, opened up the, to. No, they didn't treat me different. No. Okay. No, because it was just immediate family, and even my friend, she she didn't. Okay. So it was really just that handful mm -hmm. of people. And um, it was a very difficult conversation to have with my daughter. What she was understood. Her she, un she, she just cried. And I think she understood, but didn't understand. Yeah, because I would she say was, a nine-year-old wouldn't she, know what that is. She was, well, she knew. She was very well above her years. Okay. Because I, I started her, she was reading and writing at three. I put her in school at four. Mm -hmm. So she was a straight-A student, very, you know, and we talked about sex. We talked about being a virgin. I talked to her about everything, everything because right. little pieces of things she was seeing on TV or, like, different events she was in had teenagers in it and she would overhear conversations right. and she would come ask me about those conversations okay and so that's when i just would be totally straight honest with her exactly. and that's that's how we as parents need to be today right we need to talk to our kids and not sugarcoat mm -hmm. not say oh well papa's going to heaven because blah. no you need to let them deal with death how are you supposed to deal with exactly death? so uh, that's how i took just teaching her you know and she understood mm -hmm. but she just cried, and then we just went on to live each day normally. Mm -hmm. I guess once she saw me continuing to live and continually to do the things that I was doing, then she did it as didn't, well. It, right. She did the same thing because you know I put blinders on and um, I had tunnel vision, and I just kept living because I, you know, I was angry at God at first, but. Um, after I got over that, it was like, you know, I'm still going to do this. I'm still going to do that. I, I believe God's report. This is just a doctor's report. You know, they say I was diagnosed and I don't receive it. So I don't have it, but I'm just going to go along with what they're saying, but I'm going right. to continue to live and walk the walk that I know that God has destined me to walk. And, and that's I how remember I when I was younger and it came out. And I know people said HIV and people said AIDS, but then to a lot of people is like it was the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. And people were scared of it. So um, you were diagnosed with HIV. But did they explain the differences between both? Um, at the time, they didn't explain the difference. But HIV, um, there is a difference. The HIV yes. is when you're first getting infected with the virus, mm -hmm. and it's at a stage where you can contain it. Right. Um, after your T-cell counts drop a certain number and your T-cells, for those who don't, the CD4 T-cell counts, it's how, how well your immune system is reacting in your body. So when your immune system get 200 or below, they have to categorize and diagnose you with having AIDS. Mm -hmm. Because anything 200 or below, then you have AIDS. Okay. And once you're in that status, it's really like people say, oh, they got full blown, this, that, and the other. It's like at that time, they had no medicines. Like there's nothing that, they can do that for you they at could that do time. for you at that time, but help you transition the way, right. you know, I, God wants you to transition. And then, um, but AIDS now, AIDS and HIV now, is we have all these different medications out that can help you uh, sustain and keep your T cell counts up and help you continue to live. And then they also have what's called PEP and PrEP, you know, different medications for those who are not infected, but your partner may be infected. So there's a lot of things um, that we've, we've come a long way in 30 years. And um, 
God has just truly blessed me. But how did how did your life have to change? Whereas, because you know how they say you can even contract it. Like if you get a cut or you're handling somebody else's blood and if that person have a cut and a blood exchange, they say that you can get it like that. But having a child and then that child can fall, cut, you know, how did that, yes. how did all of that change for you? Well, it didn't. It didn't? I, I, it didn't change. I just kept, like I said, I kept living. But if my daughter fell or cut herself, I don't have a cut. She has the she cut. She has the cut. She has the cut. But if I, you know, I had to be careful because they say, like, if I would have scratched her. Right. You know. Right. So I was real careful about Certain things. how I was handling my daughter and no one else really physically. I wasn't physically touching. Right. You know, but you just be careful. And But I just continued to live and do my normal daily activities. Okay. And, again, I was, I was upset with God because I was like, why did you give me this? Why did you, you know, why am I diagnosed with this? Because you told me I was going to do this, this, this. You said I was going to be famous. I was going to be this entertainer and blah, blah, blah. And I have a nine-year-old daughter. And who's going to take care of her if I'm gone? How long were you mad at him for? Maybe a day or two. <laughs> That's it. Because I'm a faith walker and I'm a faith believer. And I was raised and taught faith. Walk mm -hmm. in your faith. You know, live by faith. And my great-grandmother raised and reared me and had me reading the Bible to her every day. Mm -hmm. And so when I asked God that question, he answered me and he said, you asked me to use you. And I did. I said, Lord, use me however you see fit. I wasn't specific. But when he said that, I look, you know the scripture that says God won't give you no more than you can bear. Mm -hmm. He That's knew it. that I could handle it. He knew that I was ready. He had already prepared me because I've made it through this, this, and this, and now this. And so I am the chosen one that he has chosen to help others heal that are going through this. You know, and you, over the years after you learned to deal with it, did you ever go back and ask him again to take it away from you? I've always asked God to just heal my body, give me everything back 100%, cleanse and wash my blood. You know, I, I want every time, every three months when I go get my blood work, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that my blood is cleansed and that the test is going to come back. Oh, you don't even have this, you know, but I still believe I don't have it. But their, their, their reports is saying that I do. But I will tell you this. It got to a point where I stopped taking medications because all the medications were getting me very down and I couldn't operate. I couldn't function. And so I went to this one doctor and I said, I'm done. I'm not taking no more meds. And luckily that particular time, a new medication came out. I was taking 13 to 14 pills a day. Mm. And they said, you only have to take one pill. I'm like, one pill? I said, but if it's make me feel like the rest of those, I, I'm not going to take it. And the girl convinced me to take it, and I tried it because my what's called the viral load is how active the virus is in your body. And I was at 60,000, so 30,000. So it had really just taken over my body, but mm -hmm. I was still functioning like nothing was going on. I'm still moving. I'm still doing this. I'm still taking care of my daughter. You know, I'm still doing everything. And I'm traveling and I'm touring, you know. And so, but the numbers were saying one thing, but my body was showing something. me something else. And, but the virus was up there. And he said, we got to get your undetectable because you're, you, the virus is really taking over. And my T cell count had dropped to 72. Mm. So classified as having AIDS T-cell count 72 not far from zero right but even at 72 I was still moving and functioning like nothing like I am sitting and here right now and that's normally not supposed to happen like that mm -mm. and so it's nothing but the grace of God that he's kept me and so now I've been undetectable for five years five six years and undetectable meaning when you're a viral load which that was the 60,000, 30,000, mm -hmm. I'm below 20. So I've been below 20 on the viral load um, for over five years. And 
that 72 on my T-cell count, the doctor said, oh, well, I said, well, what can we do to get that number up? Oh, there's nothing we can do. Just wait, just time. And I'm like, no, got to be something. So, you know, I pray and I talk to God. You know, he's my healer, my Jehovah Rapha. And my 72 now is a 575. Wow. That's, congratulations. And the doctor looked at me like, because I said, my goal this year is to hit 1,500 on my T-cell count. He's like, you're not going to get there. I said, I'm going to get over 500. No, you're not going to get there. But you I'm did. over 500. Wow. Let me ask you this. When you was dealing with this, and, and I don't know if you asked this because I had to step away, but, but seeing Magic going through it, did that kind of help you to understand that uh, kind of like his journey? Did you see his journey and did you see? Because his is more, uh, you know, abroad, right, because of who he is. Well, yeah, he, it didn't, I really tried to, all type of ways to reach out to him, to connect with him, yeah. to help me because he, they were saying, oh, Magic doesn't have it anymore and this, that, and the other. So my question is, does Magic not have it anymore or Magic became undetectable? Mm -hmm. Because, see, back then the doctors really didn't know. So, like, if they were being undetected, oh, well, he don't have it no more. But I don't know. So does he, did he totally get rid of it? Um. Oh, he was just undetectable. But see, Magic can afford, and back then, insurance wasn't paying. My medications was over $2,000 a month, mm. and I was still working a full-time job, you know. So, you know, I had to scrape it up. And it wasn't until, you know, a few years back that they've gotten different programs to help you with your medications, you know. So, so when you would see, like, stuff pop up, because I, I, I think about the, because I'm watching these limelight people, like, mm -hmm. one time, I, I remember here, the last incident, I think, was when Donald Sterling came out and said he got AIDS, you know, he, he was criticizing Magic for having AIDS because he had took a picture with a mm -hmm. young lady that he was, you know, in, in a relationship with, and he was upset. I remember old, that. He, was, he owned a basketball uh uh, NBA team and I think they forced him to sell it after he got caught saying that mm -hmm. you know like, like he was a racist or whatever allegedly but um, like um, what's one of the, did, did anybody ever find out that you had this? No. Until you told them? And, not, and in, not until I told them because at that time my career was God was still blessing me to do different bookings. I do theater, you know, out sing, you know, I, 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 I was an NBA and NFL cheerleader. So I still did everything that my heart desired to wow, do. NBA and, and NFL? What yes, year? Uh, 92 for the Seattle Seahawks, um, 1989-90 for the Seattle Supersonics. Wow. And but it stopped you from being in a relationship. I chose. You chose. So someone with HIV can also still now move on and have yeah, a relationship. Yeah, you can still you can still have a relationship. Just use uh, protection. Just like if you're not if you're not even diagnosed with it, we still all should use protection. Right. Just because of people sleeping around, mm -hmm. or because some um, go the opposite way and come back on this side of the fence. Right. So um, I could have then still been in a relationship, but at that time, my focus was me and mine. You know, and just to continue to live. And I did ended up marry. I told my fiance he still wanted to marry me. Wow. And uh, because I told him we don't have to get married. And but we did get married. But after we got married, everything changed. Mm. So I was married five years and we got a divorce. And after that, I just. No more. You know, if God throw them in my lap and say that's the one, then that's the one. <laughs> you know, do I want? I, sure I do. You know, do I get lonely? Sure I do. But I have to think about myself first. Right. And I want someone, you know, that wants me for me, wants to love me for me. You know, uh, I, I think I kind of, I'm not going to say, we were talking about breaking curse. It wasn't a curse or anything, but... My daughter's strong-willed because I'm strong-willed, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very independent. And I taught her to be independent, which c I think kind of hindered her to be a little more open to relationships, to kind of have, you know, a, a decent relationship where her and her mate is equal. I was talking about that you know, the other day because I was like, there's so many um, single parents who grow, who have kids, especially females, mm -hmm. and 
try to be so hard and teach your children that you can do this on your own. You don't have to depend on a man, mm -hmm. but that does hinder them because they don't realize that you do, when you do right. find a man, you have to learn how to be submissive and not try to be so much of a boss because you have to let that man leave. Right. And when you're so much trying to be a boss, you can cower that man down right. and not. Well, right, absolutely. And when I did get married, I did, I was submissive. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I, you know, I was submissive, but it still didn't change anything. We okay. still weren't equally yoked. Okay. You know, and it didn't get better, you know. So all of my life, I've been taking care of Verlinda. Mm -hmm. You know, I want it where I don't want a man to take care of me, but I do want a man and something that has my back that I don't have to worry about how the bill's going to get paid if I don't have this coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's what every, in every relationship, that's how it should be. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. I'm there right. for you when you can't be, you know. But I think that's what kind of made my daughter a little hard. She's tough. Yeah, she's tough. Because we've been through, we've been through a lot. And when it comes to men, and she, she saw things that I went through with, with a man. So, you know, that I know that's there. But I... I just pray and know that God will fix it one day, and He will light. He will light. He will lighten the load. Wow! Let's talk about sold out. Let's talk about the book. Okay. But before you get in the book, I want to know about the color purple. Okay. How did that <laughs> happen? Because that play, the color purple, like that is huge. Yes, ma'am. Well, the color purple came up. The color purple came about. Um, I was I was working with Disney overseas, and, and how old were you? Oh, <laughs> let me see. Cause I always got a track. That's how I keep a track of where oh, we're at. Oh, okay, is, okay. So you, you age. Let, let, let me just do this here. And how did you get that? Let's All see. Of that. Uh, nineteen sixty minus two thousand four. Okay, I was in my forties. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do the calculation. I, I, I mean, because you're, you, I can give you the year, but uh -huh. you're asking me the no, age. No, the age. Um. So when I was cheerleading, I was in my thirties. Uh -huh. So um, I was in my 40s uh, prior to The Color Purple. Prior okay. to The Color Purple, I did a Motown show review at Six Flags. And then um, that was in 2004. And then in 2004, I also auditioned for Disney. And, so although uh, you were cheerleading, you still was striving I to was be an entertainer. I, I was a full-time worker. And a, a mother. And my daughter was involved in her activities. Wow! And you were there. And I was there. Wow! I, I didn't miss a didn't miss a beat. You know, mm -hmm. God just He gave me this strength and this energy to do it all, and I was there, and um, I was still pursuing my goals. And after I auditioned for Disney, mm -hmm. that was in two thousand and four. Right. And it took a few months, and they called me, and so I got Disney, Lion King, Hercules, the musical, Toy Story. You did Story. all of that. I did all. Went overseas and did that with uh, Disney. Wow. And then while I was on tour with Disney, um, a castmate of mine, she's from New York. She and I were just having a conversation about what what plays would make a good, what movies would make a good play, and I said, the color purple. I said, boy, oh, I wish I could do the color purple. They need to come out with the color purple. Not knowing they started the color purple 2004, I believe it was, but in Atlanta. Mm. The, like a trial of run of it or something. Wow. And so a week later, she came back to me and she said, Verlinda, the color purple is already on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're lying. And she's like, no. So I'm starting researching, you know, because we have our computers and stuff. And I'm researching who the director is, who the cast in this, that, and the other. And I found the person who was casting. And I started sending emails because, you know, back then it was just the emails. and Right. You know. Um, so I sent emails. And I said, well, I got four more months left on my tour, this, that, and the other. But I really want to audition. So they said, well, contact me when you return. I did. And I went to New York and I auditioned and made it through the callbacks. And then they gave me a ticket to go see the show that night. And they said, well, we'll give you a call, you know, once everything gets back up and going. Because you know how they kind of have a little off season. Mm -hmm. And so I went back home and I never got a call and still waiting on that call. And I'm reaching out and he's not answering. So why is he not answering? And then, so long story short, when I did get a hold to the casting director, he said, well, the the uh, director went another route mm. with the person, because I was auditioning for Celie and Suge. 
Okay. And so whenever you saw the, because they gave you a ticket to see it, those are who you wanted to play. Yes. When I auditioned, I auditioned. They, they sent me who they who they know, wanted you to which audition. Which was Celia and Shook. Okay. And so they sent me the sides for those. And I learned those sides and I went and auditioned with those okay. sides. And so when they said the director went a different route, I was very mad. I felt stabbed in the back, you know, because I just like knew I just had this, right? Mm -hmm. And I met some of the previous cast members when I went that night. And I said, well, what do they do? Well, we can't say right now. Mm. So then when they did come out and say it, it was publicly said, that's when they gave the role of Seeley to Fantasia. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So I was really mad and angry about it. And I just went on living and doing what I was doing. And then it was about maybe six or seven months later, um, one of the cast members I met mm -hmm. gave me a call and said, they're auditioning again, and this is their last audition for The Color Purple. And they said, but it's in Chicago. And I was like, and now my money was really kind of low then. You know, I'm like, man, Chicago. And I said, well, that's a 16-hour drive from Dallas, you know. So um, I rented a car, went. The night before I went, I got sick mm. with a fever, laryngitis, like, just crazy mm -hmm. and so anyway <laughs> got a laryngitis and everything and i'm like okay a friend of mine rented me a car to drive to chicago i drove to chicago with my grandson and um, my uncle mm -hmm. and when we got there i just kept coughing and just really sick and when i got in line i was next up and i just said lord Give me a song to sing. Give me a voice to sing. Allow me to really make this audition. And so... And what song did you end up singing? What, what, did, what me, did God tell you to sing? Let, well, let me tell you what God did. See, you know, when you go and audition for, for plays, they, they give you 16 bars to sing. Okay. So you have to come with your sheet music. And when you walk in, you hand it to the pianist. And you let them know where you want to start and where it finishes. So... When I got to the, I had two different songs I was thinking about singing. And I said, Lord, what should I do? And he said, to God be the glory. That's what you sung. To God be the glory. And when I walked in, the director came and shook my hand. I shook his hand. And then I coughed a little bit. And I said, excuse me, I'm a little under the weather. And he said, well, what song are you singing? And I said, my tribute, to God be the glory. And so I gave it to the pianist. And I stood there in the center. Then, you know, they'll tell you when to start. So they pointed at me to start. And I sing, um, just let me live my life and let it be pleasing unto thee. And shall I gain any praise? And after that, my voice just came. And the director, he slammed the table and stood straight up while I was singing, like, in shock. Like, oh, wow. You sing like that and you're sick. Give me that to God be the glory. Let me hear that. I want to be, I want to be there. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All oh, that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. Come on now. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his power, God has saved me. And with his power, he's raised me to God.
All right, all right. Be the glory mm-hmm. for the things he has done. Man, shoot, man, I'm about mm. to get the offering played out. They're going to have to pay to get this. Ooh, glory. You know, man, thank mm-hmm. God for you, man. That Your high note. Extraordinary. Um, so that's when he stood up with a high note. <laughs> Oh yeah, and he slept. I, I can imagine that because he knew what he was looking yes, for. Yes, I can imagine. So what did he say? He he was just in awe. He just couldn't believe it. He was like, "You sound like that, and you're sing, and you're sick." And I'm like, "To God be the glory." I said, "My God never fails me." You know, he 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 was there for me. I asked him, and he always supply what I ask. And All right. So what part did you get? And I ended up getting um, the role of. Church lady Darlene, but Suge's understudy. Mm. Wow! Did you ever have to play Suge at all in no. any of those places? They, 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 didn't, they didn't want me to. Them girls fought teeth and nails because you know they don't want the underdog to show them. Up. Right, right. That's all right. God had a plan and a purpose, mm-hmm. didn't he? Wow! Yes. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Man. And, and then speaking of the color purple, right. after I finished that tour, um, a Chicago theater did another. Uh, Local, another local, and then a short mini tour mm-hmm. where I got to uh, play Suge with Jennifer Holiday. Oh, Jennifer you did. Holiday was uh, Sophia. Wow, mm-hmm. wow, man! How did that make you feel? Awesome. I can you imagine. You know, just, just, you know, God is just amazing. You got what you wanted. I, everything I asked God for, because you wanted to provided. play Suge. He has provided. He has provided. Wow, I just like I said, man, your story is simply amazing. You know what I mean, like. Everything that you really share with us today, you know, like to still be, you know, standing, you know, to still to go through everything that you faced, all these different challenges, and you still here, man. You know what I mean? Yes. Looking beautiful as ever. Thank you. Doing your thing no matter what. Trying to stay young. Really, ain't no sense in nobody <laughs> making no excuses that they can't make it, man. <laughs> Listen, man, it, it, ain't no excuses. You know what I mean? Yeah. People need to step up and get up, man, and pull the bootstraps up, man. But we're going to talk about the book now. Mm-hmm. So this book right here, Sold Out. Yes. How did, what inspired the book? Well, actually, um, it's a book anthology, so there are several um, authors in the book. Okay. I did a play called Soul Purpose. Okay. And Soul Purpose, uh, that was in, I think it was in the year 20, let's see, that book was released 2021. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, two years prior to that book mm-hmm. being released, I did the play Soul Purpose. And during this play, God was doing some things in my life. He was working on me and like wanted me to come forth and be totally transparent. And I wasn't ready because I'm a speaker as well. And I would go out and I would speak, but I wouldn't be totally transparent because Mm -hmm. I didn't share my story. And so God just kept challenging me. And I'm like, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But when I was doing this play, Soul Purpose, the lady who was over the production, her name is Cheryl Pillow Williamson. And, um, She's the only other black woman that I've ever met that reminded me of myself. Wow. You know what I mean? As far as thinking the way she conducted business, just her professionalism, the way she carried herself, just everything. And how she was very open and giving and wanting to share the love of God, share, you know, say not just her wealth, but what God has given her. She wanted to pass on and help others receive. And during these rehearsals, I broke, I kept breaking down Mm. and we would pray and God broke me down one time and then I shared my story with her. And after we did the production, she approached me with doing the book and I said, I'm not a writer, you know, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready to tell my story. And so I said, let me pray about it. And I prayed about it for a while. Then I came back and I, you know, I finally surrendered to God, you know, his calling for it. And I got a chapter in there t- titled Being Kept by Faith While Beating the Odds. And um, so I, that's how I came about doing the book with her. And there's several other authors. And um, the, uh, the, not the theme, but the, the topic of it was speaking about um, how you overcame your tragedies through radical faith and prayer. Mm. So my title chapter, um, we talked about how I've gone through molestation, domestic violence, being raped, uh, going through uh, anxiety, and then being diagnosed with HIV. Wow, wow, that's 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 something else. How did you feel after you did this and you was able to share your story? I felt, I felt 
freer. <laughs> I felt more relieved. It was to the point, you know, when you say you don't care what people say, what people think. Um, God had positioned me, and it's all about God's timing. So 20-something, 20 27 years later, it was time for me to, to come public. So for 27 years, I didn't share. So when I was touring, when I was doing this and that, no one knew. No one knew anything. And uh, when we, I shared this story, a lot of people, well, you don't look like, well, what it's supposed to look like. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. You know, people have their thoughts mm -hmm. on what something should look like when a person is sick, this, that, and the other. And, well, what were your symptoms? Well, there really weren't any symptoms. I can't tell you what the symptoms were. When you're feeling bad, go to the doctor, get tested. <laughs> you know, that's all I can tell you. But since coming out with this book, I was like, I was fearful of writing. And so the way I wrote my chapter was I talked and, and recorded myself in my phone. And then I, I used to be a transcriber, so then I would transcribe everything on paper. And then I had a couple of friends that were really good friends, and I had them to come over, and I said, I need you to just ask me questions. Talk, ask me questions. So I recorded the conversation, and I gave them a few questions I wanted them to ask, but then I wanted them to just ask me questions. And that ha that's how I put it all together. Wow, that's so that's amazing, man, truly amazing. You, um... Like, like you got to think about it, man, your story, man. What would you say to that person that might be going through something and they closed off and they're not able to speak out like you did, you know, after you went through your journey? How, how can, what can you say to help a person that might be holding back? I would first say find someone that you trust in to have an in-depth conversation with about your situation that you feel comfortable with. Then seek some professional help whether it be a counselor or a doctor you're going to and ask that doctor, can you refer me to someone that I can sit and talk with? Um, once you confide in someone, you, you feel a burden lifted, number one. But find someone. And if, if they don't have anyone, um, call me. You know, I am open um, to someone calling me and wanting to talk with me to, to get more of an insight of how I put up my tunnel vision and just kept moving forward and I kept living. That's the key. I kept living. I, I never say I have. No, this is what I was diagnosed with. I never have claimed it. I'm not going to ever claim it. But I will tell them as long as they wake up, if God woke you up this morning, there is still a plan and a purpose for your life. If you don't know what that is, you find someone you can talk to and confide in. <clears throat> Sometimes it's not your family member because they don't understand. I've spoken at six different conferences. Six years I spoke at a women's conference for women living with HIV AIDS um, through the Legacy Cares here in Dallas. And the stories that I hear, how some of their families just push them away and this, that, and the other, you know, it's very heartbreaking. So I want to let them look at me and see the light that God is still shining on me. You know, that, hey, if she did it, I can do it. If you don't have anyone to talk to, talk to me. I started an organization, Overcomers for Life, because I am an overcomer. And Overcomers for Life, we're raising health awareness on mental health, HIV, AIDS, domestic violence. Okay. We, I've gone through all of those things, and a lot of those things are still kind of traumatic at times because when you don't have anyone to talk to, your mind is very powerful and your mind can play tricks on you, you know, so you really need to find someone that you can talk to on a regular to help you get where you need to go. And if you are diagnosed and know you have HIV, stay regular with your doctor, take your medications, exercise, try and, and change your diet, you know, have, have a good, healthy eating habit. You know, you can splurge every now and then, but try to get on track to keep yourself moving forward. Don't give up. Don't fall weak. Don't say, hey, I'm mad and I'm going to give it to somebody else. You know, just. We've had, we've had people that, that they have arrested for doing stuff like yes, that. Yes, yes, ab absolutely. And I just, you know, part of me not being in a relationship is I didn't want to have that conversation. <clears throat> I didn't want to say to you, 
this is what's going on with me. And then I didn't want the rejection from yeah, you. Scared of what the response you know. would be, right? So I, that's why I just shut it down. I just totally shut it down. Am I happy about it? No, but I, I kept living and I had other things that I needed to do. I said, God is not through with me. Wow. He's not through with me. This is only the beginning. But yep. to give, I'm, I'm here to give hope to those who are lost, to those who are confused. And I'm sure you've helped so many. Yeah. Why, can we get this book on Amazon? Yeah, you can get this book from my uh, website, okay. verlindastanton.com, V-I-R-L-I-N-D-A Stanton.com. And the book is $28. Um, but you will be so blessed. There's other stories in there that talks about PTSD, how some women had to overcome that, and how some when you lose a loved one, how to kind of get through that, walk your way through that. There's a whole lot of different other stories in That's there good. that will help benefit you because you may not be dealing with HIV. Exactly. But that book is not just for that. But that book sold out volume two, one. Why is volume, where is volume one? Volume one is on Amazon. On Amazon. Um, so what does volume two give you that volume one didn't? Different authors, different stories. Okay. Well, I'm not going to say stories, different testimonials. 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 And different testimonials. Which one is more powerful? Um, I haven't totally read volume one, so I'm not going to lie about it. <laughs> but this one is very powerful. And will this there be a very, volume three? Um, I'm not sure. That's all depending on Cheryl Pellote Williamson. She's a multi-award winning author. And we got bestseller with volume two okay. in three different categories on Amazon. Wow. So wow. I am now classified as a bestseller. Hey, <laughs> come on now. I'm a bestseller. <laughs> you know, God, God will, he, he will keep you. He will push you. He will test you. And for those of you, when you feel like you're about to fall off the bandwagon, just give God some praise Come on now. and say, Lord, help me. Lord, carry me. Lord, show me. And if you don't know what your purpose is, Lord, open my eyes to see. And in order for you to hear from God, get yourself in a quiet place on a regular basis and talk to him. Pray to I talk to God like I'm sitting here talking to you guys, mm -hmm. you know, me like too. literally. And. When you do that and you close off everything else, then you can hear from him. Right. And he can show you. You may want it to do a whole lot of different things, but people told you, you can't do this, you can't do that. I never let people tell me what I cannot do. Wow. If my heart desires it, then I'm going to do it. I want to bring up the, the best is yet to come uh, CD. I got another guy named Pimpin' Ken. He brings me CDs and all mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I have to, he, I, yeah, he always going to bring you something, you know. <laughs> but when did you make this? Um, 2013 is when it was released. Wow. And after, yeah, after I came off tour with Color Purple um, in 2011, God did some miraculous things, you know. I, w I was blessed with um, several accolades from Tyler, Texas. Um, the key to the city. Yeah, you got a street down there named after you. Yes, Verlinda Lane, East and West. And that lane is also the county road I grew up on. Wow, mm -hmm. ain't that something? You do, It's <laughs> you, Jamie Foxx, and we just presented uh, Bird, Birdman Bird and Slim with a painting down there in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Y'all are only three the other that are alive there. that have a street that are here that to we know it, of. That Earl, we know Earl of. Campbell. Earl Campbell got one too? Yes, he has. Where is he at? In Tyler. In mm -hmm. Tyler too. Mm -hmm. Boy, I think, it's called, I think it's Earl Campbell. Earl Campbell Park. Shout out to Tyler. They doing their thing down there. Yeah. Well, man, thank yeah, you. So, yeah, yeah. What, so vision wise, because I know we were talking off air and you're talking about a museum. I want to know <laughs> what you intend to do futuristic. Well, futuristic. Um, this, the, well, let's. Can I back up to the okay, CD? Because he brought up the CD and I didn't get to Let's say get it. Let's get CD. it. What, what, what's, okay, what, the CD what you is titled talk about? The Best is Yet to Come. And the CD came about when I was on tour for The Color Purple. You know, when we go to travel to different cities, we go to do radio interviews and right. TV interviews and what have you. So I wasn't the principal cast member, but I got asked to do a lot of the PR when different cities we went to and then when we would go places they would say well do you have any music but I didn't have anything so it inspired me as I was on tour I gotta get some music I gotta get something and put it together right and then um, I asked permission from the writers um, 
Stephen Bray, Brenda Russell, and uh, Allie Willis, who mm -hmm. did the music, for permission to re-record a couple of the songs and put on my CD, and they gave me those the permission to do that. And then when I got back home from touring, um, I gathered up some musicians, um, George Faber uh, from Tyler, and we, we got to work. And I recorded this CD and released it 2013. And wow. and it and I put it on all social media, not social media, but I guess the streaming, streaming, streaming platforms. platforms. You know that was through CD Baby at the time, and it really got a lot of plays. And I was getting little monies here and there. And um, one That's day, dope. one day I got an email from 20th Century Fox, and I was like, I don't think this is real. So I sent it to my attorney. And he said, oh, it's real. So they wanted to use, I, I re-recorded God is Trying to Tell You Something. And they wanted to use my song on an ABC sitcom, wow. Fresh Off the Boat. Come on now. Wow. So did they? They did. And it was a wow. chick came, a big chick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a Molly Jackson. Oh, yeah. When, <laughs> they were trying to get me a cam. We were trying to get a cameo of me right. on the show. But they had already written out the scene. And the scene was that the two main actresses would be in a car driving and my song playing on the radio. Yeah. But And it was down low. And so they were talking. And they were talking about the color purple. And then all of a sudden they turned it up and they were singing along with me in the car. Wow. So... Mm. But yeah, Congratulations, I got a check man. for that. That was that was beautiful. So <laughs> that's a blessing. And then back to your question mm -hmm. again. What yes, about the museum. The <sighs> okay, the museum came into mind is because starting my organization, I also wanted to start a, a museum, mm -hmm. an entertainment museum, um, of people like myself who's gone through a lot, who's accomplished a lot. And then my daughter and grandson always teases me when they come to my home. They say, Mom, your, your, your house looks like a museum. <laughs> With all these different, you know, accolades, pictures and things of that right. sort. So I was like, you know, I want to, I, I want part of my legacy of leaving is a museum with all of my accomplishment and my artifacts in there, along with other local people who have made it. Wow. You know, like and I you said. you want to put it in Tyler, I, Texas? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't know. Wherever no, God tells her to put it. Wherever God tells me to put it. But I want it, I want it to be something meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, they they tease me. Well, when you're gone, we're going to get rid of all this stuff. We're not, not going to be talking and Logan all this. So I said, no, I need a museum. Right. Because, number one, it's it's part of history. I'm, I'm part of our black heritage history. And... God has just blessed me, me, this little country gal that just had a desire to sing and be an entertainer. And I, I want the world to know. The world, all of the world doesn't know. I've traveled the world. I've traveled abroad. I've been to Johannesburg, South Africa, been over there ministering. And, you know, it's like every people need to know. There's still people in Tyler don't know I have a street. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know. Wow. Thank you That's so much, crazy. man. Hey, we appreciate you for coming on the show, man. How can people get a hold of you if they're trying to reach out? They can reach out to me on my website, verlindastanton.com or overcomersforlife.org. Top three artists of all time, dead or alive, any, any genre. genre. Any. My top three artists is Patti LaBelle, Aretha oh. Franklin, and Natalie Cole. Man, check it, man. <laughs> it's going down, man. Belinda, we appreciate you for coming on Boss Talk 101. Mm -hmm. I know this probably won't be the last time I'm going to do things like this. Often I ha also have other shows that I'm, I'm planning and doing, so I'm going to be mm -hmm. asking you to come back for different times if you don't mind. Okay. And I just want to say thank you so much, and God and, bless and, you for your story. And thank you. If you ever have magic on or connect with him, I need to connect with him. I'll definitely, okay. uh, I'll definitely do be the connecting dot for that. You know, I am one of those guys. I mm -hmm. am one, I am the chosen one. <laughs> thank God for it. Somebody had to do it. Come on. Come on. I need Here am I, Lord. <laughs> You know, I'm the one. So, yeah, and not the two. But check it, man. Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk, man. And we out. Thank you.